tell stories because all the animals have different kind of personalities. And it's a way to illustrate in a fun and gentle way what is meaningful and what is valuable to your community and to your people. And I know that PBS is like doing the same thing. It, it's using stories to illustrate the values of PBS. And, and it is an incredibly powerful thing because everyone has a story. Everyone has a story. And the importance, I think, of PBS and one of the things that I have found so incredibly um, gratifying in terms of being involved is that PBS provides a safe space, a safe opportunity to share those stories. Um, and so that is one of the things that I have found um, so remarkable about this opportunity uh, in terms of, of working with PBS on this, um, this, this option with, with getting the uh, Muscogee materials kind of intertwined with the Mali of Denali. Um, materials. So can you go ahead and switch it to the next slide? Can y'all hear me? I can. I just, oh, here we go. Okay. Okay, okay thank you. So um, when we are sharing our stories and generally speaking the Muscogee way, um, if you're wondering what it's like to be a Muscogee or a Creek person, um, when you are taught from the very beginning, what it means is a good heart is all that's needed. Uh, that is our, our one commandment, if you will. Uh, if you do something, you do it with a good heart. Every single thing that you do, you do with a good heart, which is as easy as it sounds and as hard as it sounds, right? It's very difficult in a lot of ways to do something all the time with a good heart. Um, but at the same time, it's a very simple thing if you are taught to do it. Uh, and, and if you don't mind, I'm going to take just a second to do a very, very short story um, just to get you in the kind of mindset of the Muscogee way of telling stories. Uh, again, I said we use uh, animals to kind of guide um, what our children are thinking, kind of give them examples of behavior uh, so that it's not uh, people that are being used, it's animals and their kind of behaviors are our guides. So I think most of you are familiar with the attitude, might makes right. Have we, how many of you have heard that kind of um, philosophy, might makes right? Yes? Have we heard that? Am I talking to myself? No, no you're, you're fine. You're getting yeses, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, wonderful, thank you. Okay, so, um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of strong animals, right? So who who would think? Uh, let me let me ask you this: Which one's stronger, a wolf or a rattlesnake? What do you think? Who says wolf? That's a good question. It wolf depends on what kind of strength. Hmm. Exactly. Well, I'm just gonna just asking who's gonna raise their hand for a wolf. <laughs> Penny Penny says wolf. I see it. Okay. There. Who says rattlesnake? Looks like I, I'll say rattlesnake. Sierra, okay. Says rattlesnake. So if I'm talking to kids <laughs> about is who's the strongest leader and is is strength what it takes to be a good leader? This is our Muscogee story about that. Okay. It <laughs> is said that wolf and rattlesnake had a contest to determine which had the most deadly bite, which was the strongest. Rattlesnake quickly struck Wolf twice in the face, but Wolf on the second strike caught Rattlesnake behind the head and bit down so hard that he severed Rattlesnake behind the neck. Wolf then lay down and died. The worms ate them both. It is never wise to become enamored of your own power. Now, what is the lesson to our children? What do you think? Anyone want to venture? Anybody, anybody? Is it about strength? What was the story about strength or was it about wisdom? Wisdom. 
Jana Thank says you. strength is not superficial. Correct. Correct. You can be super strong, but what difference does it make if you have no wisdom with it? Right? So might does not make right. Wisdom is what you need. That's the story, right? So there's so many things. Okay. So good heart wasn't present by either of those entities. So they both lost, correct? Simple stories, very profound. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk about the traditional Alaskan introduction. And I don't know how many, I have 15 people here. So did you see in the chat what the traditional Alaskan introduction is? I put a little note. Did you see it, everybody? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we, we did start that a little bit when, when we first when lost you when gone. you lost your power. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I, I want to I wanna talk about this just in the point of everybody has a story to tell and everybody is safe space. So when we were working on the um, Molly of Denali Family and Community Learning Workshop, um, it was such an incredibly imperative part of that workshop that we do this introduction with the families. And if y'all have had an opportunity to do it, um, I'm sorry I didn't get to hear it, but I would love to hear at least, you know, somebody or one or two people that are brave enough to go through this. And, and again, brave meaning I'd love for you to share what you would like to share because um, it turns out that there are so many incredible stories and, and it doesn't matter whether you're Native American or African American or Irish American uh, or Jewish American, the stories are remarkable and they are about survival and, you know, continuation and care and, uh, and it brings people together. So just if, if there's anyone that's willing to kind of just do this quick little um, summary of themselves, I would really appreciate. Is anybody willing? I know Shiana had hers written out in the chat if she's willing to share. Hello. Oh, thank you <laughs> so much. Thank you so much. You got me, huh, Tasha? <laughs> I'm so proud of you. I know. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, as you said, it was already written out, although it's not in this one, but that's okay. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't see it. I apologize. No, no, it, it's not in this. It was in the previous um chat but regardless hi everybody i'm shiana <laughs> valentine um my mother is sarangani valentine well actually her maiden name was jai singer i suppose and i should say i'm shiana valentine williams thank you and um my father it was donald valentine um their parents um th they're from sri lanka i'm from sri lanka their parents were from sri lanka um he be, and I'm not pronouncing the rest of his name because it's it's fun, not fun, or it's fun, depending on how you want to go. So PB and Felicitas, I actually, my middle name is actually after my grandmother on my dad's side, and on my mother's side, her parents are Bernard and Beryl. You'll notice there are a lot of Western names because of the British colonial times. Um, exactly. And so again, we're all from Sri Lanka. However, my parents were on the either side of the Civil War. So my mother's family was Sinhalese and my father's family is Tamil. Um, so they met and here I popped out. My husband is Adrian William, Valentine Williams. He's from the Bahamas. Um, and our children are Gia and Kelan, born right here in Orlando, Florida. And we have two dogs, Sudi and Nungi. What a beautiful awesome. story. That just shows how incredibly diverse our families are in America. And I just love sharing all of that information. Thank you so much. Does anybody else want to share? Go ahead, Roshana. You know you can. You've done it before. I can, but I, um, I don't see the prompt. But I'm going to do it based on what I saw You've earlier. You've done it before. I know you can. You make me proud. I am Roshana Marlita McNeely Beard. Um, my maiden name is McNeely. I'm married to Jason Beard. I am the daughter of Rochelle Marie 
McNeely Timmons and um, Archie Dean yeah. Hill Jr. I was raised by Joelle Lamar Timmons um, in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, and as a matter of fact, my great great grandmother was full blooded Cherokee of um, one of the Oklahoma tribes um, on my mother's side, and her name was Birdie. Um, by way of Mercer University, I am now in Tallahassee, Florida with my husband and our three children. And I have found out in the last few years that I'm an empath um, when it comes to people's spirituality and um, their personalities. And I'm also a doula, birth worker, and a teacher. Thank you. See, isn't it fascinating to find? So I found oh. out that Roshana had native heritage when we were working on the Molly of Denali um, program and her family was there. And one of the, the parts of the Molly of Denali program is to do a family tradition. And Roshana was talking about me bringing fry bread. And I'm like, where did that come from? <laughs> and it turns out we've got some common heritage. So there you go. You, it's such a fascinating thing to find out people's heritage and, and the connections and the, the values that you will have in common, even if you had no idea when you were going in. Anyone else? Tasha? Been there if you want, Misty. Oh, Michael, please, please. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my name is um, Michael Dayton Dreyer. Um, uh, my name is um, Jewish German in origin. <clears throat> Um, I think my last name, if I'm not mistaken, means uh, the, the number three, so I don't know any sort of um, meaning behind that, but uh, uh, my, grand, my great grandparents' names, um, we used to call them um, Big Mama and Pa Dad, um, and then I'm, my grandparents are um, Bruce um, uh, Mitchell, and my grandmother is Carol Mitchell, and uh, they're, my parents are, uh, and my family in general, are mostly all um, uh, originated in some way or another from uh, the Celtic world, so either Irish, Ireland or Scotland, um, as well as um, uh, my dad's side, my uh, uh, Germany. And um, we've been in Florida for since the 1700s for the most part, or at least some of my family has. Um, I'm one of the first members of my family to leave Florida in a couple hundred years, or at least on my mom's side. Wow. So, um, and yeah, I, and as far as my anything else, just I love teaching and I love teaching history specifically. So, thank you, Michael. All right. So I, I guess you're getting an idea when you when you have these. Um, opportunities for families to share kind of the way they have gotten to the place that they've gotten and then everyone gets an opportunity to see that um, and then they see that while they may have some differences in terms of their values they can also see a lot of similarities between each other um, before we go to the next slide i just want to explain a couple things that are probably unfamiliar on this slide to you um, uh, it says right there, Dan Penton Miko. Dan Penton is my father. He is um, the traditional uh, Miko, which means chief uh, for the Muscogee Nation of Florida and also for the White Earth Tribal Town, which is our ceremonial town where we hold our traditional busks, uh, which is the four ceremonies that are held every single year, which is traditional, goes back to prehistoric times. Um, you may have heard of them like the green corn ceremony. Those are the types of ceremonies that we do. Um, and Helis Haya, where it says former Helis Haya, Helis Haya means the maker of medicine. So he was, uh, for 20 years, he was the maker of medicine for the ceremonial town. So this is my father and I was raised extremely traditionally. So even though my mom is uh, white, she is of Irish and Welsh descent, um, I am very much a traditional Muscogee uh, matriarch because I was raised by a traditional maker of medicine and Miko. So I have, a, I tell people I have a very interesting background and in that I'm bicultural, which is a lot like being bipolar, 
when you're raised by a traditional maker of medicine. All right. Um, can I answer any questions about that? Because I know that's a bit unusual. So I'm happy to do that. Not yet. Scanning. Okay. Next. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to tell you I'm I'm keeping an eye on the the videos of everybody. So I'll let you know if someone raises a hand or anything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So who are the who are the Muscogee people? And I said it very quickly, and I just want to make sure that I didn't lose anybody. Um, Muscogee people are also uh, called the Creek people. We call ourselves Muscogee. Um, most people call us Creek. So if the Muscogee Creek people, I'm just kind of immediately translating for you. Um, the British people called us the Creek people just because we were located by creeks, right? Um, so very quickly, um, we are very resilient people. Clearly we've survived. We're very practical people. Uh, speaking of practical, there's a pandemic on and we just had our uh, green corn ceremony, which is our new year ceremony. Uh, after the solstice, we have new year. So happy Creek New Year, everybody. Um, and in order to have our ceremony, we only need to have our Helis Haya, our Miko and our beloved woman. And that's all that we had because we don't want people to die. That's practical, right? Um, we were resilient clearly because we are still around uh, even after removal and a tremendous amount of uh, difficulty. Um, we're matriarchal and that is actually a very unusual thing. So I'm happy to answer questions. That's gonna, that's something that will take a longer time if people wanna talk to me about it because it is a very unusual thing. Um, thank you. Happy New Year to you too. <laughs> um, of course, most Muscogee people are in Oklahoma and in Indian Territory, but a few of us actually have avoided removal by hiding out in swamps, much like uh, the Seminole people did. Okay, some of us avoided it in North Florida, which is where my people are. Uh, we are still in Bruce and in um, Blundstown. That's where our tribal towns are and our ceremonial town is. And we have uh, a fire, we have a square grounds, we have a ball court and a council house. And that's what all original towns have. Next. Okay, this is just a map that shows where the tribal town is and where the um, actual Muscogee uh, council house is. So the council house is in Bruce, which is to the west of Blundstown and that's where the ceremonial town is. So White Earth Tribal Town is the ceremonial town. That's where we have our four ceremonies every year, which again, have gone on since prehistoric times. Um, as far as we understand it, our square grounds, White Earth Tribal Town, is the only square grounds east of the Mississippi that has had continuous ceremonies since prehistory. So it's a pretty remarkable ceremonial town. And then the Muscogee Nation of Florida is in Bruce, and that is our political arm. So the way Muscogee people operate, we have a ceremonial town and a political town, and it's always that way. It's always a duality. You don't want your people that are your political people handling your ceremonial stuff. Next. Oh, this is my favorite. Okay. so. The way we think about things is that everything that you get, everything is done with a good heart, right? Every single thing you do is with a good heart. And I know in that first picture, I should have taken a moment to point out, but you saw that picture of me holding my grandson. In case I didn't point that out, that's Troy. He's my grandson. And I was wearing this gorget, the shell gorget. I don't know how well you can see it, um, but it's actually a picture of an eagle and he's flying in between how well, I don't know how you can see it. He's flying in between two different realms. Um, and this is a shell. And to us, shell in and of itself is actually a sacred text. Shell came from the sea and was deposited on the earth. So that makes it in between two different elements. And that means it's a sacred text. If you're writing on shell, it's sacred. So what's on this, is a bird, an eagle, which is a symbol of power, and a messenger. And this messenger is taking a message 
from the middle world, which is where we live, to the upper world, which is the world of order, which is the world of perfection. And it's basically saying good news, okay? So this is something I get to share with my grandson. I get to teach him with this about how Muscogee people think. Eagles are messengers. If you're taking something to the upper world, it's a message, okay? So Christopher Thompson is our sacred shell carver. If you are a person that does carvings of shell, you are actually a sacred entity in and of yourself. Uh, previously, you wouldn't be allowed to talk to a shell carver. Uh, shell carvers would be kind of isolated, kind of in a hermetic seal because they have to fast for days. They get um, their ideas about what they're supposed to carve from one above, literally. And, uh, and basically in this new era where we need to share as much information as possible about our culture so that, so that it doesn't go away, so we don't lose it. We wanna share it with the, with the young people. We wanna share it with everybody because it's important. Um, people wanna know. So Chris has made himself available in terms of letting people know about the importance of his work and what he does. And so while the matriarchy, like me, I'm the educator, I'm the, I'm the verbal one, I'm the one that goes out and shares, uh, he is the male duality and the, the sacred um, element through the shell and, and the communicator in that way. And I would, um, I would love to take this time to share um, this opportunity and uh, show this video for you. Thank you, Tasha. Mm -hmm. Can everyone hear it? Not yet. Can't hear it. Oh. Hmm. You might have to go back out and share your audio. Yeah, I, it was checked. But let me see what's going on here. Hmm. We'll try it again. This is a medicine cup. Sorry. That time. No, okay. No, okay. Here we go. It's a little pixelated, but you can hear it. This is a medicine cup. This has grandmother. We were on it. She brought the fire across the water. This is a lightning well. Its scientific name is Busicon contrarium. While other snail shells spiral to the right, the lightning well spirals to the contrary direction, to the left. When my mentor was talking to me about carving, I was like, how do you never move the Dremel? And he goes, well, we always move to the left, so I'll always be turning the shell to the left and keeping the Dremel pretty much straight in my hand. This came off an uh, old piece of Muscogee pottery, and it's basically our dance patterns. Everything goes to the left. We dance to the left. I do carvings to the left. The reason we do that type of thing is we think it, it helps keep this middle world in balance. People see me doing this without this on me. <laughs> Chris Thompson is a Muscogee shell carver. Basically, when you're doing this stuff, you're, you're walking in two worlds. You have to be part of the world outside, but then I have to come back to my native side. A lot of people don't have any understanding that there are still Native Americans that live in this area. I think the perception is all of them got removed to Oklahoma. Um, and that perception is not a surprise given the, you know, 1853 law that natives weren't allowed to be in Florida, period. And then given the Jim Crow laws. At the Fred George Greenway and Park Museum, Tallahassee residents have the opportunity to get to know their native neighbors and learn about their culture. The Greenway is 170 acres. And Wildwood Preservation Society, it's open once a month for free lectures. It's very interesting to a lot of people to be able to see and have an opportunity to meet some of the native neighbors that they actually have. I'm 48 years old and 
my dad is in his 70s, his early 70s. He is a ceremonial leader, and for about the last 20 years, he's been trying to gently move us into we can't keep all these things secret anymore because we're lo losing the young people. We have this opportunity, we have this place here, things like Chris's shell carving. We have shell carvers. They used to not be available. That was something you would not be able to talk to them about because it's basically sacred chore, sacred task. There's not too many people in the southeast that are still shell carving. We have probably about three artists that are doing it right now. A lot of people, they don't use medicine cups like these anymore. They actually use regular shells or little tin cups. And I started wanting to bring that back also, where we can carry on the traditions of our ancestors. Which you see a lot in our shells, that will be a representation of the upper world, the middle world, and the lower world. And this one right here tells the story of after we die. We play the ball game for the creator, the ball pole and the fish at the top. After we pass, we believe our spirit goes up that ball pole into the Milky Way. It's just an example of our ancestors riding a canoe across the Milky Way and then spiraling down. But that's, I did that one just because I never saw it done, so I wanted to do it. <laughs> it's not in any books, it's not in anything like that, it's just what I believe it would look like. A lot of people think that natives are very connected to nature, and certainly we are, the Muscogee people are, and our ceremonial cycles are based on that. In the springtime, we have the pollinators, the butterfly there, and basically they can do two things. They can spread love, spread pollen, and also carry souls. So again, everything in nature has its kind of duality, if you will, in the Muscogee world. So every time before I get ready to carve, um, we do a fast. It's almost like part of me is going into that shell. I have to feel that carving that I'm doing. There's a lot of times I won't even carve, like if I'm upset, because when I'm carving a piece for a person or so, I don't want to put that energy into the shell. There's been a month that I've went without carving because I had to get myself straight before I could even start working on pieces. For Misty and Chris, Muskogee medicine cups are no longer just ceremonial tools. They are a way to connect with people about their culture. It's one of those things where you can't imagine how someone else thinks until you've had an opportunity to talk to them about these things. And it's, it's new for them. For us, it's just the way we do. <laughs> for WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas. so much for sharing that. That was just one of my favorite pieces. What a great share. Rob is amazing. Just wonderful. Uh, you know, I, and I'm going to say this about that. Christopher Thompson is one of the shyest people <laughs> in the world. And for, um, for Rob to get that five minutes, it took four and a half hours. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you should really, really appreciate Rob um, because he is a professional and he was able to get um, Christopher Thompson to really open up. I'm um, really pleased with how well, how authentic um, WFSU was able to get this piece. So that was just very, very exciting for me to see that come together. Um, anyway, so that was, does anybody have any comments or questions about that piece? Because I know that's a pretty, pretty deep piece, actually. Let me pull up the chat because I don't want to miss anything. Loved it. Yep. I loved it, too. <laughs> okay. Um, so generations of storytelling. We'll just get into this really quickly. 
Um, one of the things that, that Native Americans do, and this is something that um, I'm just going to share with you really quickly, and again, if this is something people are interested in, I'm happy to share. Um, we actually task uh, individuals in our community with jobs. Um, and it's basically based on after years and years and years of deciding who seems interested and who seems good at, at what they're doing. Um, and so for many, many years, I listened and loved to learn um, to our storyteller who was Granny, we called her Granny, um, Margie Gaddy. And um, she very sadly um, passed away last summer. And before she did, she told me I was the next storyteller. And not only was I the next storyteller, but she had amassed um, a collection of all of our traditional and sacred objects into a traveling museum and that I was now the tradition keeper and um, steward. <laughs> and so I, I was shocked and honored, but now that is what I am. Um, and so these things happen very quickly sometimes and, and then you are, you are that person. So now after years of listening to stories, I am now the storyteller. Um, and then fortunately for me, uh, we have this incredibly beautiful soul uh, named Sophia in our community, in our tribe. And she has the same uh, spark that I had, which is that she can't help it. She wants to learn. She wants to know the stories. And you'll see her to the right of me in this picture. And uh, this is us at San Luis Mission. And I'm telling stories. And she is already signed up to help me. So she is now tasked to be the next up for our future storytellers. Next. <laughs> Misty, you want to show her video, right? Yes, if you can. If yes, you yes. Pull it up right now. That's what I'm getting ready to do. Okay. Oh, and, and while you're about to cue this up, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Misty. I was just going to let everybody know that this is the Fred George Museum, which is partnering with WFSU and where we have done the um, Molly and Denali pilot work. And it was just an incredible match because all the families felt super comfortable in the museum. And it was so wonderfully helpful for our mission because what we wanted to do was reach all these families and get this facility used. And it was just the perfect combination. Anyway, just wanted to point that out. Thank you so much, Josh. Yeah. A storyteller is important to the tribe because if there weren't storytellers, no one would really know all that stuff, like the stories and the traditions and loyalties and traits, and it wouldn't be quite a tribe. The role of the storyteller is to remind people how to behave, share value systems, while people are enjoying themselves. What I saw in her is, is much like what was in me from the time I was very young. I want to put pieces back together. I want to understand this. Our tribe actually made about 25 years ago now a decision to not be secret anymore. If we don't share it with the young children, if we don't share it with everybody else, then it will effectively disappear because we don't have enough people to keep the knowledge alive. She wants to help, she wants to learn the story, she wants to learn the language, and she wants to share that with people. Now that there's Molly of Denali, kids are more likely to want to go into nature more and want to explore and learn about, about plants and animals. I think this type of program is important because there's not really that many shows about natives, especially for kids, but also there's not that many shows for kids that make them want to explore nature more. One of the initial feedbacks that we as PBS got about the Molly of Denali show was that the parents were noticing that their children, when playing outside, were thanking nature. 
This is one of the very, I think, profound differences in the way natives view Earth and the world around them and other cultures do. It is very interactive with us. It's not stagnant. The young children get it, the understanding of connectedness and the profound power of interacting with these things. And they can say thank you because it's meaningful. Oh, I love that one so much. I know. <laughs> so precious, so, so free and so precious. So amazing. And then, then there's Granny. <laughs> You're gonna make me cry now. So <laughs> three generations. There it is. So part of the Molly at Denali uh, Family and Community Learning Workshops is that we actually get to do um, a little museum at the end and we have artifacts and we do a bio sketch of somebody that was very important to you, um, an elder. Uh, a lot of times people have chosen, oh, actually cho I already brought one to share because it was so cute. Um, this was, can you see this? This was a Durham family artifact. And this was the bio sketch of their grandmother. Can you see it? I can't see myself. Oh, there we this? go. Yes. Okay. I, I to so so they off. actually, they actually brought their grandmother so they could draw her perfectly, and then they wrote all these amazing things about her. So this is this is what the family and community learning workshop pre-pilot looked like with Molly. So this is what we did with with Brandy for our kind of pop-up museum that's going to go along with it, and it just shows her history and how we learned about each other. And we did kind of a modification for um, the Muskogee values that kind of went along with um, the, the Alaskan values. And to be honest with you, I can't really see it because it's pixelated, but I think it says learning about each other and your gift is your responsibility. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so that's, that's basically, there's, there's uh, we went through and did quite a few uh, values for Muskogee Way, which I think is going to be really interesting. Um, but one of the things that we were always taught is your gift is your responsibility. And that's sort of the idea of being tasked. Um, once you learn how to tell stories and you're good at that, guess what? You get to do it <laughs> because it's for the good of the community. What you're good at turns out you get to do that for the community. And that's, that is one of the values, the community values for Muskogee people. Um, and then, you know, I just uh, add a little, little explanation about how Granny would involve all of us. We were all very small. And, you know, in the, in the way of Muskogee storytelling, she never made the children feel small. She made us feel important. And one of the best stories, um, Muskogee stories, was the, the great turtle was always very important. Um, in the Muskogee uh, way of thinking, the turtle gave her back for the earth. So she's very important. But later on, she becomes kind of arrogant and she gets her, her shell cracked, which is another story. But the ants actually feel sorry for her. And the ants are very small, right? Just like children are. And the ants feel sorry for her and they actually decide to help her put her shell back together. And so when they decide to work together, they help the, the turtle put her shell back together and fixed it. So what Granny taught us is that through her stories, children, while they are small, are still profoundly important. Your size is not what matters. It's your heart and your actions that matter. So this is something that stories um, are very fundamental and, and this is how they teach you and, and show you how to live. Anyway, um, and let me show you something else fun, something else great with Granny. Oh my goodness, I'm sure I had it right here. Too many things to share. All right, I guess I'll have to show it later. <laughs> okay, 
<clears throat> so another part of our um, kind of pop-up museum curriculum that we're sharing um, was created by uh, an artist, Michael Kelly, who is an adopted member of our Muscogee Creek family. Um, he actually joined us about six years ago and was what we call called to the fire. He came and just participated in every single ceremony and stayed. Um, so he is now a leader of the young men in the White Earth Tribal Town and an incredible artist. And he created these paper dolls so that we can share out our history and even like let people understand kind of the roles, the ceremonial roles that people are, are you know, filling. So to the left is me, I'm the new storyteller, which is still kind of hard for me to accept. I'm trying, I'm trying to fill this role. Um, and on the right is Granny, who was our, of course, ancestor and our, our storyteller in our heart. Um, and, you know, uh, of course, next on the roster will be Sophia. So, you know, when she starts doing more, she's going to get her own paper. <laughs> um, and then we've got like a whole series. And let me actually uh, show you. Can you see these? I don't know if you can see. Can you see them? I don't see on my Not screen. Yeah, no. you're a little frozen. Oh, there oh, we go. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay, so this is the whole series. And then wait, then you've got the animals. <laughs> so you got my, my grandson, who's Troy of Muskogee, to go with uh, Molly of Denali. And then the idea, can you see this? Maybe not. The idea is this is Troy. And he's got his regular clothes on because he's you not know, just a kid, but he also has ceremonial clothes when he goes to ceremony. You know, like regular kids and native kids when they go to a ceremony, just like if you go to church, that's when you wear your ceremonial clothes. Next. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's see if anybody has questions about that. Anyway, so all those, all these paper dolls will be available, right, on uh, PBS yes. Learning Media. It's amazing. So we've been using them as part of the Molly of Denali Family and Community Learning Workshops, and they're beautiful. So yes, we'll be able to share those. Thanks to Misty and Michael. Um, I still have my soap. Artifact. <laughs> <laughs> Say that again. I still have my soap artifact. Say it again. That's oh awesome. my gosh, did you know that we're, um, we upgraded it to uh, air dry clay now? Yeah, oh, so we wow. decided that's, right. that's a, <laughs> the joy of being a pilot station is we try out things and we think, hmm, Here we go. it's not going to work. Can you see so this? <laughs> Can you see that's, this one? Yeah. This is, this is Troy with all of his, with his regular clothes and his regular shoes and a ceremonial clothes and his moccasins. These are creek moccasins specifically. We have um, a style where it's a uh, closed toe, pinch toe moccasins. And then this is his shell gorget. Isn't that cute? All right, so, and then we're talking about the, this is exactly what we were just talking about, which is we did this um, family and community learning workshop at the museum and nature center. And it was such an incredible hit. You actually got to see a little bit of the, the um, outside footage when we did the iNaturalist with the families. Uh, Roshana's family was there. It was a blast. Um, I would say number one is we created a safe space for everybody. Roshana, would you agree with that? Yes. Put me on the spot. Yes. Okay. <laughs> But I think, I think that was critical. I think that um, when you're going to try and talk about values, you're going to talk about kind of uh, families, uh, you, you really need to make everybody feel comfortable in their own space. And then also with the facilitator. So um, the facilitator, I believe, also has to be a part of the disclosure. Um, so whoever is going to be running this Molly of Denali workshop, I think needs to be kind of a part of it. I think they also need to be saying, hey, this is who I am. This is my background. Um, Roshana, do you have a perspective on that? I know you're a facilitator too, so you, you may have some feedback. Can you ask that question one more time? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, in, in my opinion, when I was the facilitator for the Molly of Denali, I felt like it was important to 
uh, for the facilitator to be kind of disclosing of, of their background and the way uh, their value system was because of the way the Molly of Denali program is framed with all about values and communities. Um, what do you think about that? Do you think that's an important position for the facilitator? Um, I think it's a very important um, position because um, no, no, I was not doing Molly and Denali, but I had to take into consideration the, um, the fact that um, the, the camps that I facilitated were in um, our Title I um, impoverished areas. So what um, things were, was I thinking and putting out there? So if I gave an example, I had to think about what um, modalities and means they had at home versus just saying, oh, get this, because it may not be something they can go buy. And which is why I did like the soap opportunity because they could buy the soap, carve in the soap, take a picture of it and then use the soap later versus having to go buy something and purchase it and it's like they can't do it at home later. Yeah, that's true. That's true. All right. Yeah. So, so that was basically for, for me, I just found the fact that everybody felt very open about communicating. Everybody got really interested in um, going out and using the iNaturalist program. I thought that was a very enjoyable thing that continued on, I, you know, like you had mentioned and even like, you know, shared it out with your school. Um, I thought the the idea of values, which in the beginning, as I as I think most people know, it's hard for children to get their arms around values. You know, that's a kind of a an amorphous thing. But we were able to talk about it after we talked about, um, you know, what does that mean to your family? You know, what is your family's values? You know, and it was really interesting to drill down with each family. Remember remember that discussion, Roshana? And how like uh, it came down to a lot of people just saying um, kindness was a family value to them. Do you remember mm -hmm. that? The, yeah. the, the kids had to, it was very difficult for them to kind of get down to something simple. And that that's ultimately what a lot of them came down to so that their kids could really get their arms around it. I thought it was lovely. Um, so anyway, I, I found this particular workshop just to be extremely enjoyable in terms of all the different backgrounds of people that were involved, getting to know each other, and then getting to create something, you know, that was uniquely theirs for each family. And we're going to dive in even more deeply to Molly at the end of our um, next session, too. So right. I, I knew questions you were, so and... I'm not going to, won't take too much time on this. No, all I'm right, glad you'll next. be there, Misty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thank y'all very much. I don't think there's um, anything else I wanna say. I'm just gonna let you know that this whole, a good heart is all that's needed. We did um, develop 16 values that go with um, the Muskogee way. So those are available, which is kind of interesting because believe me, they weren't like written up, they were all just oral. So that was kind of a fun process. Uh, so those will also be available on the PBS Learning Media as part of this, you know, curriculum um, enhancement. So I'm really excited to have had this incredible opportunity to work with PBS. It's been, you know, just an incredible gift. Thank you all. Masicho. <laughs>